yeah hi friends so yeah let's uh, begin with the mcqs so the first one is uh, self of presented with hearing loss and it's a feeling of fullness in ear on auto autoscopy multiple bony swellings were present yeah in the external auditory canal yeah okay okay then uh, which of the following features the diagnosis of esophagitis so yeah i repeat it's a question is a surfer is presented with a hearing loss and there is a feeling of fullness in his ear so on autoscopy multiple bony swellings were present in the external auditory canal which of the following features the diagnosis of esophagitis we will tell what is which of the following is basically diagnostic of esophagitis and the options are unilateral irregular sessile and the last option is seeing cartilaginous canal So yeah, if anyone wants to answer this, which is a feature of esophagitis in the ear? Option number one, lateral irregular sessile and seen cartilaginous canal. Yeah, if you want to answer this, okay, the okay the answer here is C, right? It's sessile because there is a difference between esophagitis and there is one more thing called osteomyia. In osteomyia, you see it's some single thing, whereas in esophagitis, there is it's a multiple. So yeah. It's a sessile also, so yeah, in esophagitis it will be multiple sessile, and yeah, it will be seen in the deeper canal and bilateral. So yeah, the difference between the esophagitis and osteoma in this condition. So its osteoma will be pedunculated in the outer canal, whereas esophagitis will be inside and it will be sessile and multiple. Next question we have: It's a 33-year-old patient who comes to you with the ophthalmology OPD. With the complaint that her vision becomes temporarily blurry after a hot bath in the evening, this resolves by itself after a few hours. So she has a past history of episode of painful unilateral optic neuritis three months back, which resolved with steroids. What has been described here? Basically, they have given there is a history of three months back that the optic neuritis was there in the patient. Yeah, hello. She optic neuritis was there in the patient and three months back. So now she has come with you with a complaint that there is a temporary vision loss, and after a hot bath in the evening, so yeah, and it resolves after a few hours. So which of the following is described here? That is the pulpitus phenomenon, or top phenomenon, layer matter sign, or it's a redox phenomenon. Basically, it's a case of multiple sclerosis. If anyone can try this, if you want to try this, which of the of the phenomenon is here? Basically, there is a Temporary vision loss after a hot bath, and there is a history of optic neuritis in this condition. So the options are pulpitus phenomenon, otto phenomenon, layer matter sign, or it's a redox phenomenon. I think mostly you won't be knowing, but if you know, it's okay. Right, okay, the answer is B. That is otto phenomenon is the right answer. See uh, that pulpitus phenomenon or it's a layer matter sign are all basically it's about multiple sclerosis only. So yeah, it's about see layer matter. You know, when you do a passive neck flexion, there will be a like it will be painful. It's a little bit short light sensation. It leads to a spinal shoulder. So yeah, and pulpitus phenomenon is the illusion of the depth per perception. It's seen in MS lateral multiple sclerosis. Next we have according to the Wessler scale. Yeah, according to the Wessler scale, which of the following person? Would be categorized to have an average intelligence, and the options are child whose IQ is 125, a teacher whose IQ is 115, a banker with an IQ of 95, or it's an alcoholic man with an IQ of 85. I will repeat. It's uh, according to a Wessler scale, which of the following person would be categorized to be an average intelligence? So it's an uh, IQ of 125, 115. 94 or 85. Basically, it's a child with 125, teacher with 115, banker with 95, or alcoholic man with 85. Average intelligence. Anyone? 85. Alcoholic man with 85 is average intelligence. No. Let's see. That is a banker with IQ of 95 will be having an average intelligence according to the Wessler scale. So yeah, they are given actually for all. It's ninety-five to one zero four is the average, and um, it's if you have a bright, it is one zero five to one one four. So basically, it's from zero to one seventy-five now. If you see zero to twenty-four, you are idiot, and it's it's like that only full. 
So yeah, next we have the oxygen carrying capacity of a 18 year old boy with a hemoglobin of 14 gram per DLS 22, 16, 14 or 18 I repeat the oxygen carrying capacity of an 18 year old boy with a hemoglobin of 14 S 22, 16, 14 or 18 Anyone? Okay, yeah, there is a formula here. It's like um, anyone wants to try this if I'm just try the formula. Now the answer is D, right? It's 18 is the right answer. How it is see the oxygen carrying current capacity it's 18 and it's like according to the above question when HB is 14 gram per DL, the oxygen will be 1.31 into 14, that is 18.34. So yeah, it's a formula like it is uh, Oxygen carrying capacity formula is 1.31 into the hemoglobin which is being given. So yeah, there is nothing to tell much. It's the formula only to remember. So it's 18 is the right answer. So 1.31 into the hemoglobin given in the question will be 18. Yeah, 18 is the right answer. Next we have it's a six-year-old mentally retarded girl with a protuberant abdomen, short stature, cold facial features, and cloudy corneas. Skeletal malformations include dystosis, multiplex, and bullet cell middle phalanx. What is the enzyme deficient in this patient? And the options are idonurate sulfatase, beta galactosidase, alpha L idonurate, or it's a beta gluconinidase. So, yeah, it's a six year old mentally retarded patient girl with a protuberant abdomen. Short stature, coarse facial features, cloudy corneas, skeletal malformation are dystosis, multiplex, and blood cell middle phalanx. So basically, you have to know what is their diagnosis. Then you will need to know what is their enzyme deficient. Is. So yeah, the diagnosis is Huller's disease. Huller's H U R L E R. Huller's disease is a diagnosis here, and uh, deficient is C. That is the uh, alpha L iron is the deficient enzyme here. It was previously known to be as gargoylism. I know I don't know this basically. It is present on chromosome four, and uh, the treatment is enzyme replacement of that enzyme. Okay, let us remember. Next, we have uh, which of the following is true regarding the given distribution of ages of the patient over visiting a family parent clinic in a day. And the age is 20, 31, 31, 31, 25, 28, 35, 38, 31. I don't know why my voice is not clear. Okay, yeah. It's uh, which of the following is true for the given distribution of ages of the patient who are visiting a family clinic in a day. Basically, they are given a PS, PSM question and they are given all the values. That is, age is 20, 31, 31. I have to find out the mean, mode, median and what all is there. I will just get the formula here because I cannot tell all that values for that. Mean you know it is the average value in the all wide, whatever the number it will be. It's like I am teaching you maths. Mode is, is a frequently occurring observed value in a distribution. So yeah, h is equal to, yeah, it's the formula here again. 20, 20, 20. It's 15, median is 15. Oh, mean you are telling me, mean is that much only. Yeah, next we have uh, given below is the histological section of the cornea. Identify the structures marked as S and Y. That's uh, again I image this question. Okay, I'll just tell what it is. It's basically human cornea and they have given the, all the layers of the cornea. Right, it's a corneal epithelium which they have shown as X and Y is the corneal endothelium. So yeah, quite interesting topic. It's not interesting only. I'm also getting bored here. So yeah, but it's a random MCQ on this. So yeah, I'll just tell what are the parts of the human cornea. That right? is the corneal epithelium, Bowman's layer, corneal stroma, decimates membrane, and corneal endothelium. So yeah, next we have next question. It's a sexually active woman presents with you with cauliflower-like lesions on the vulva. 
the biopsy of the lesion is taken and the histopathological reveals the following picture what is the most likely causative organism so yeah it's a sexually active woman presents with cauliflower lesions on the vulva the biopsy is given and it's a historical basically it's a case of hpv yeah it's a case of hpv and you have to call the quality organism so and uh, what will the image show in the image shows the coelocytes it's a characteristic feature of infection with hpv so yeah there's nothing interesting here but these all the questions come so yeah, i'll just tell in hpv it is coelocytes which has to be seen in the pathological picture and that's it nothing else there there will be cauliflower lesions on the vulva and biopsy will show it's a coelocytes it's a characteristic feature of HPV. So next question we have a full term infant with a history of polyhydromyos in utero presence with a respiratory disease soon after birth. On examination the child has trolling of saliva and the resident suspects it's a tracheoesophageal fistula. So what is the most common type of fistula likely to be present in the child? A, B, C, D. Just tell me what is the most common tracheoesophageal fistula in the children. That's it. In short, what is the answer? Just tell that. Anyone? Just tell me what is the most common esophageal fistula. If you can tell the answer, then it's okay. Type A, B, or C. A, B, C, D. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's uh, C is the right answer. Because type C is the most common type of fistula likely to be present in the child. Next we have a patient presents with complaints of crushing chest pain related to the joint dysphagia. It starts whenever he has high stream and he takes sublingual nitrate dressing when it's, it provides relief. So he underwent a manometry which showed simultaneous multi-peak contractions of high amplitude. amplitude. What is the most probable diagnosis? Okay, I'll just tell it again. It's what we have to tell diagnosis here. There is a crushing chest pain. He did into the jaw and dysphagia is there. It starts whenever he has a high stream and it is sublingual nitrate dressing for that. And it provides him relief. He underwent a manometry which shows a simultaneous multi peak contraction of high amplitude. What is the most probable diagnosis? And the options are achalasia cardia, diffuse esophagus spasm, hypercontractile esophagus, or it's a nerve tracker esophagus. So, yeah, it's just that I think it's B. Yeah, B is the right answer. Yeah. The well, options are Achilles cardia, diffuse esophagus spasm, hypercontactile esophagus, or not tracker esophagus. So, yeah, you have to just tell the diagnosis. I'll repeat all last time. It's a uh, complaint of uh, crushing chest pain is there. It written to joint dysphagia. It starts whenever he has ISM and he leaves on taking sublingual nitrate listening. And he underwent a manometry which shows simultaneous multi peak contraction of high amplitude. And the answer about the diagnosis here is it's a diffuse esophageal spasm. Okay, it's a basically hyper, hyper, yeah, it's a hypermotivated disorder of esophagus in which basically it causes a spontaneous contraction when you have something, something like cold. It's in distal total of esophageal body and yeah, it's triggered by cold for what I said and it usually present with chest pain and dysphagia. So yeah, the diagnosis will be esophageal spasm due to some uh, cold trigger. Next question, what is the investigation of choice in a 55 year old woman who presents with postmenopausal bleed? Options are pap smear, endometrial biopsy, fractional cure attach, or it's a CA125 estimation. I repeat, what is the investigation of choice in a 55 year old woman who presents with postmenopausal bleed? It's a postmenopausal disease, it will be carcinoma, I think. So yeah, it's uh, options are pap smear, endometrial biopsy, prasinal curator, you know, it's a CA125 estimation. Anyone just try it out. Yeah, it's endometrial cancer. The answer is, if you can tell. Well, the answer will be endometrial biopsy because uh, as I said, you are suspecting a cancer here. It's endometrial cancer, which is very high. So yeah, the answer is endometrial biopsy here. And pap smear basically when you are supposed to screen it is there. Next question we have uh, the garden state deformity is seen in which of the following condition? Options are Galeozy fracture, Smith fracture, isolated terminal fracture. No pap smear is basically for screening. 
and uh, we don't use pap smear for uh, well, if you are thinking that it is a diagnostic you have to use biopsy so yeah next question it was the garden spade deformity seen which of the following condition and the options are galeozy fracture smith fracture isolated anna fracture or it's a coli fracture so again you tell you guess it out garden spade deformity seen in which condition galeozy smith isolated anna fracture or it's a coli fracture Okay, I will just tell it's a B is the right answer. It is Smith's uh, Smith fracture. You see a garden spade deformity. So yeah, Smith fracture. Yeah, you know it's a distal one third of radius with palmar displacement. With the fracture of a distal one third with the palmar displacement in the Smith fracture. It's basically reverse of Coley's fracture. You know, Coley's fracture is also distal radius fracture. So yeah, so the garden spade deformity seen in. Smith fracture and Coley's you see which deformity if you can tell in Coley's we see a dinner fold deformity and it is uh, and here what I told it's a garden spade deformity next question we have according to the Ericsson the major conflict in the first year of life is between which of the following yeah it's a psychiatric question according to the Ericsson the major conflict in the first year of life is between which of the following trust versus mistrust initiative versus guilt autonomy versus shame or it's a intimation versus intimacy versus isolation so it's a first year of life so i think it's answer uh, so will be i will just repeat the options it's a trust versus mistrust initiative versus guilt yeah autonomy versus shame or it's a intimacy versus isolation in the first year of life Major conflict. Trust me, sir. I don't think it is your team. Got it. It's uh, okay. The answer is A. I don't know why, but yeah, the answer is A. That is, it's a trust or a mistrust. It's a major psychological, psychosocial conflict seen in the first year of life. In this year, the child must learn to trust others during the first year of life. Okay, okay, in that way. Okay, yeah, the it, it is the answer is A. That is trust or a mistrust. is in the first year of life conflict is there so identify the malam patti class of the patient okay i get say image they have given they'll just tell what is malam patti you know it's for nscci you see malam patti class of patient to put the intubation tube so yeah it's from 0 to 4 and the 0 is like ability to see any part of the epiglottis class 1 is soft palate forces you will have visible class 2 will be Tip of the uvula not visible, visible, and last three is base of the uvula vis visible, and last four is only hard palate is visible. So yeah, malum patti score you have to know as well. Intubation basically in anesthesia before any anesthesia procedure you check for malum patti classification. Yeah, next one we have it's a hepatitis B infection. Uh, in hepatitis B, a patient comes to you with the liver. Yeah, it's a hepatitis B infected patient. Awaiting for liver transplantation is admitted with ascites and encephalopathy. So, which of the following is the drug of choice for him? So, yeah, the options are interferon alpha, lamivudine, tenofovir, and it's a telpivudine. So, yeah, it's a surgery question. See, it's a hepatitis B infected patient who is awaiting for liver transplantation is admitted for ascites and encephalopathy. Which of the following is the drug of choice? Interferon alpha, lamivudine, tenofovir, or it's a telpivudine. Anyone? It's basically decompensated liver disease because already it has gone to acidic and encephalopathy. So what is the drug of choice here? It's okay. The answer here is C. That is tenofovir is the drug of choice for any decompensated liver disease with all that cirrhosis and cirrhosis. Yeah, it will be there. It's an acidic and encephalopathy with the hepatitis B. Okay, yeah. Uh, interferon alpha is one of the first line. It's in ongoing HBV DNA replication, but it is contraindicated in decompensated. And option B, that is lamivudine and telbivudine, is not considered as the first line for that. So yeah, the answer is C, that is tenofovir is the right answer. Next question we have, uh, which uh, which among the following is the monoclonal antibody that is 
uh, it is specifically against VGFR and the options are Beva Ki Jumab, Rani B Jumab, Rami U, Ram Siru Maab and it's Afli Barsept. So yeah, I will repeat it's uh, which of the among the followers is more to an antibody that is targeted against specifically against VGFR. So yeah, if you can tell it's a difficult question, but yeah. Bevasi Juma, Rani B Juma, Ramus C Juma, or it's a apply percept. So yeah, I will tell the answer. It's basically C Ramus C Juma is the right answer. It's a motor antibody that binds to the VGFR and inhibits the binding of VGFR ligand. It is indicated in NSLC, a gastric cancer, and metastatic colonic cancer. So yeah, you have to remember this. We have to remember where it is VGFR. So yeah, so many lights from one person I think. Continue on that. Okay. So VGFR. VGFR is basically indicated in NSLC, gastric cancer and metastatic colonal cancer. So yeah. Its answer is Ramusirumab. Next question we have. Uh, which of the following is not an anti-apoptic protein? BCL again all the genes we have here. Okay, I'll just repeat. Which of the following is not an anti-apoptic protein? BCL HL, BH, BCL2 or MCL1. If you know the protein name, sorry, know the gene name, then only you can tell. Sorry, protein name, what I'm doing. Yeah, which of the following is not an anti apoptotic protein? BCL HL, BH, BCL2 or MCL1. So yeah, I will tell the answer because you might be knowing or not. BH and BK are the pro apoptotic proteins. So they get inserted into the mitochondrial membrane and result in formation of channels. They allow proteins from the inner mitochondrial membrane to leak out to the cytoplasm. And where the anti apoptotic proteins are BCL to BCL itself. So you have to remember both what are the anti apoptotic proteins and what are the pro, pro apoptotic proteins. That is BAH, BAK and anti is BCL2 and BCL itself. The questions are all like that only. It's okay. Next question we have which layer of the epidermis is primarily impacted by dermatophytes? Yeah, this you can tell. Stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum basal, or it's a stratum spinosum. Yeah. Anyone, this is a interest, not interesting, but yeah, you can tell the answer. Which layer of the epidermis is primarily impacted by dermatophytes? Stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum basal, or it's a stratum spinosum. Anyone? Okay, no one wants to answer. Well, the answer is A because it's atom corneum is the right answer and it's seen in basically dermatophytes. Dermatophytes are basically dermatophytes will only survive in dead dead cells. So yeah, that's why the answer is atom corneum. Yeah, it will yeah, it survive on dead keratin layers of the skin, hairs and nails as they are keratinophilic. So yeah, dermatophytes will only impact the dead parts. So it, the answer here is atom corneum. So next we have it's a pap smear of a patient. You come across the following finding, and what is the diagnosis here? So basically, it's a very it's a repeated question. Every day I'm seeing this question is coming every time. It's again the same question. It's a clue cells. So anyone can tell where do you see a clue cells in the pap smear? Was well, every day same question I'm getting. But uh, clue cells in the pap smear and the options are lymphano lymphogranuloma venerum. Bacterial vaginosis, trichomoniasis, and gonorrhea. So, yeah, if anyone can tell, clue cells are seen in which condition? ST store. ST, yeah, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Stratum corneum is the right answer. I only, I already moved on to the other question. So, yeah, pap smear of patient is there, which uh, clue cells are present. And what is the diagnosis? Yesterday also we discussed lymphogranuloma venerum, bacterial vaginosis. Psychomoniasis or it's a gonorrhea. So yeah, it's a bacterial vaginosis. Basically, it happens, you know, as it is lactobacillus is present in the vagina. When the lactobacillus decreases, there will be a the normal there is acidic pH. I mean, the lactobacillus will decrease, and the pH will increase. So that it's a you can tell it's a opportunistic infection, mostly by Gardenella. So it will cause a bacterial vaginosis. And there is an Amsel's criteria we discussed yesterday also Amsel's criteria. That is thin white yellow homogeneous vaginal discharge, pH will be greater than 4.5 and there will be fishy odor of the discharge 
as intuited by one adding a 10% KOH and the last one is closed cell searching on microscopy. Next we have you are evaluating a case of hyperpigmentation. The patient had a history of adding a lectomy a few years back for Cushing disease. MRI shows an enlargement of the pituitary adenoma. What is the diagnosis? And the options are Nelson syndrome, Steele Richardson's all say Jewitsi syndrome, Hammond Ritz syndrome or Job syndrome. I will repeat it's a case of hyperpigmentation. History of adenoectomy few years back for Cushing disease. MRI is an so the enlargement of pituitary adenoma in there. What is the diagnosis? Nelson syndrome, Steele Richardson or Jack Swiss syndrome, Hammond Ritz syndrome or Job syndrome. Anyone? What is the syndrome here? It's a rare complication of adenoectomy, if you can tell. Okay, your answer is Nelson syndrome. It's a, it's a, it's a rare, rare complication or it's a, yeah, it's a rare complication of total bilateral adenoectomy and yeah, Nelson syndrome is the right answer. There will be enlargement of the pituitary gland after you remove the adenoid gland for any reason. So yeah, it's a clinical triad and the triad is hyperpigmentation, excessive ACTH will be there and cortex of adenoma will be there. So yeah. Next question we have, which of the following condition is not associated with amodron therapy? So yeah, the options are transient suppression of thyroid gland, hypothyroidism, thyroid toxicosis, or it's a silent Nelson. Nelson, ah, Nelson syndrome is the right answer, yeah. So yeah, where I was, yeah, which of the following condition is not associated with am amodron therapy? And the options are transient suppression of thyroid gland, hypothyroidism, thyroid toxicosis, or it's a silent thyroiditis. Anyone? Amodron. Not associated with amodron. Transient suppression of thyroid gland, hypothyroidism, thyroid toxicosis, or it's a silent thyroiditis. Okay, the answer here is, yeah. Where the answer is like that is a silent thyroiditis is not associated with amodron therapy. Amodron is given for what you know what when do you give amodron? Anyone? It's for arrhythmia, I think. Yeah. So amodron has the following effects on thyroid gland. That is there will be transient suppression of thyroid gland, hypothyroidism, and thyroid toxicosis will be there. But yeah, the D, D right in the silent thyroid is not the correct answer, it's a wrong answer here. So yeah, next question we have, when is the following they have given on X-ray is there? I think it's a Stagon calculus. Okay, I'll tell the question first. It's a X-ray they have given while performing a voiding cystic urethrogram for a two-year-old child. Which of the following investigation will be useful for evaluation of the renal scarring in this patient? TC99M DMSA, TC99M DTPA, TC99M MAT3 or it's a TC99M Patek net. So yeah, I repeat, it's a it's where they have given and while performing a voiding cystic urethrogram for a two year old child, which of the following investigation will be useful for evaluation of the renal scarring in this patient? TC99 DMSA, TC99 DTPA, TC99 MAT3 or it's a TC99M Net. So basically it's a case of VU, VUR, sorry, VUR, VUR is what it's a vesicoelectral reflux. It means that the urine is going above, normally the urine should go from the kidney to the bladder, but it is going above, it's a reflux from the bladder to the kidney. So yeah, it's very common in children, VUR is very common in children. So yeah, for that what to do, we use a investigation that, yeah, we use TC99 DMS, so you have to remember this. TC99 DMS we use for VUR and it's for yeah, investigation choice to evolve it for renal scarring in the replace nephropathy is TC99 DMS scan. Anyone can try, going to try crown length of a 6 month old fetus. Okay, I will tell you the answer is 30 cm is the, basically it's a crown hill then in the six month old basically there is a formula it's a rule of haste and rule of haste is that during the first five months